electric current and circuits. We start with a hardcore current question. A wire is oriented along the x-axis. It is two meters long. I'm going to start drawing. X, Y, Z. And so here's a wire. I've drawn it not to scale. It is two meters long. So I'm going to call that L because it's much easier to talk about these things if you have variables. So L is two meters. And its diameter is five millimeters. So what I'm going to do is define R to be 0 0.0025 meters. So R is the radius of the wire because that'll be easier to use. But what I gave you is the diameter. Be careful to read. Make sure if you see the word diameter, you don't treat it as a radius. The wire is made out of copper. The conductivity of copper is 5.7 times 10 to the seventh amp volt amps per volt per meter. And it's carrying a respectable current. So this current is respectable, you can tell, because it has a top hat and a bow tie. So that's a respectable current of 5.5 uh, amps. Actually, what I'm really saying is, ooh, 5.5 amps. That's a current. So, um, fine. It's a respectable current of 5.5 amps moving in the plus x direction as I've drawn. What is the current density J in the wire? So remember what current density is, current per cross-sectional area, and notice it's a vector. So I take the current, which is I, and I divide it by the cross-sectional area, pi r squared, and I went and told you that the current is going in the plus x direction, so it's that. Yay, we're done, except I gave you numbers, so I should probably plug that in. So it's 5.5 amps divided by pi times 0 0.0025 meters squared, x hat, so that I can stick into a calculator. And the result is 280113 amps per meter squared, which are the units of current. You're like, wow, that sounds like a lot, but well, let's think about it. This is a dinky little wire, right? And a square meter is a big old thing, and this is a little tiny fraction of it. And to get 5.5 amps and a little tiny fraction of a big square meter, you're going to need a big number. So the right number of sig figs, that is 2.8 times 10 to the fifth amps per square meter. So that's the current density. And I left off x hat, which is important because this is a vector. So in case I need this again, I'm going to stick this up here, although I'm going to stick it up to, full, or to extra digits, which you should always do. All right, so that's J. So that's the answer to part A. Part B, what is the drift velocity of electrons in this wire? And so that's, okay, so here's this thing. Well, you could just look up the equation, which actually is probably what you will end up doing. I don't have the equation memorized. I'm going to see if I can just kind of figure it out. So um, remember, I know there's going to be a number density, and we're going to get a total number of electrons. We have to multiply it by a volume. So the volume is going to include the cross-sectional area which I'll go ahead and write in the cross-sectional area is pi r squared. And then what's the length I use? You're tempted just to use L. Um, that would not be the right thing to use in this case. I mean, you could use that. You would get a volume. You would get the total number of, well, this would correspond to the total number of electrons in here. But we don't have current per volume. We have current per cross-sectional area. Oh. So what am I going to do to get a volume to get a total number of electrons? Well, let's not worry about that yet. We'll come back to that in a moment. So we have uh, number times pi r squared. We don't have electrons per length. All right, I do want to worry about that length. What's the volume? Well, what we're going to think about, remember current is charge per time. All right, but we don't, we're not asking for electrons per time. We're just asking for electrons. So at some point, I'm going to have to multiply by a time. And I realize here that if I make a length here that is v times delta t, all right, where delta t is just some small time interval. Um, and if this is the drift velocity, then v d times delta t, all the electrons in here, in this length, are the ones that are going to cross this area in the next time delta t. So that's a reasonable length to use. All right? So this, n times the area times that length, this is the number of electrons that are going to cross this area in the next time delta t. And it's just it's a little weird to think about v, d, t, v delta t as a volume, as a length, but that's exactly what it is, and that's the length we care about. If we pretend, 
Actually, we should say charge carriers because, of course, we have the problem that electrons are going that way. So let's pretend they're positive charge carriers for a moment. We'll come back to electrons later. That if we pretend, instead of all the random motions, that the charge carriers are just slowly moving along at the drift velocity, then yeah, all the ones back here will be at the area a time delta t later. All the ones closer will have crossed the area. And so current density is current crossing the area and current is charge per time. So that's the number of charge carriers. So we have to multiply it by the uh, charge of one charge carrier to turn into the charge. So that is the total amount of charge that's going to cross in the next time delta t. Uh, and what that, if we divide the amount of charge that crosses in the next delta t by delta t, we get the current, right? Amount of charge crossing per delta t. Oh, very good. With one little wrinkle here. Notice I'm just talking magnitudes. So really I should put in the absolute value of the charge, because we know the current's going that way, but the electrons are going that way. If I was doing this with a, um, if I did this in terms of J, which is probably the equation I gave you, if I did this in terms of J, I would have to use, I could use this X at, and then we'd be fine. We'd just get, uh, VD would turn out to be in the negative X hat direction. Um, and we're just going to have to know that. All right, so I'm asking, what is the current density in the wire? We know it's going opposite the current because electrons have negative charge. So we'll do it this way, even though this is a little different from just plugging into the equation I gave you. So I can cancel the delta T's. I am after VD. Um, did I give you the density of electrons in the wire? I didn't. Uh-oh. So we're going to be in total trouble here when we get to this because I don't know the um, density. So I'm going to have to make an assumption, and I will do that. Um, in any event, let's proceed. Um, so we have n pi r squared, blah, 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 so on and so forth. So Vd is equal to, uh, I, I can do this, I. We know that absolute value of Q for an electron is just E, the fundamental charge. So I have to divide by that, I have to divide by pi r squared, and I have to divide by n. And right, this is great, I can look that up. I have this number, I have this number. What is this number? Well, that's a little bit challenging. So how do we figure out this n? I don't know. So I'm gonna make an assumption here. That each copper donates one free electron. That may not be exactly right. And you could Google around a bit and see if you could figure out, find a respectable source. It may be actually that each copper donates two free electrons or on average one and a half each, even though there's no such thing as a half electron. What that really means is two coppers donate three electrons. But fine, I'm gonna make this assumption. So what that means is that the number density of copper is going to equal the number density of free electrons, just because for each copper there's one electron. And we know that the number density of copper is going to be the mass density, I'm using rho for mass density because, because I'd like to, divided by the mass of one copper atom, and now these are things we could look up. Um, so that's going to be the number density of copper is equal to that. So I'm going to go ahead and look these two things up. All right, so here's what I get. I'm gonna, I need to do some unit conversion, so I'm going to do it over here. So carbon the density of carbon is 8.96 grams per cubic centimeter. And the mass of one carbon atom is, I had it in my head, it flew away, 63.5 AMU, right? But we need to convert this to grams. So how do I convert AMU to, sorry, not to grams, to kilograms? Well. One gram, we know, is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 AMU. And one kilogram is 1,000 grams. So I can do that unit conversion now. Uh, and here, I need to convert this to kilograms per cubic meter. So I can do one kilogram divided by 1,000 grams. And then um, there are 100 centimeters in a meter, and I have to cube this factor, right? So I get centimeters cubed, and I'll have one over meters cubed, so I'll end up cubing that 100. So when I put those two things in my calculator, the mass of copper is 1.054 times 10 to the tiny, or tiny specifically, in this case, is 25 
minus 25 kilograms. That's the mass of one copper atom. This is plausible. Remember that a proton or a neutron is about 20, 10 to the minus 27 something, and so we have something that's about 100 times bigger, but not quite, and for 60 protons, hey, I probably did that right. And now this I actually could have done on my head, right, because 100 cubed is 10 to the 6 divided by 10 to the 3 is 10 to the 3, right, so 100 cubed is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, divided by 1, 0, 0, 0, you cross off three zeros, you have a 1,000, so this is going to become 8960 kilograms per meter cubed. So the point of all that is now we know an N. We know that N is number copper <coughs> is equal to 8960 kilograms per cubic meter divided by 1.054 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. So the number density of copper is 8.497 times 10 to the 28. All right now, uh, per cubic meter. Now the point of all that is like, wow, that was a huge cul-de-sac. That wasn't, what I just did here wasn't E and M, and it wasn't current. What I was doing was, oh, there's a number he didn't give me, we're done, we can't go any farther. And, uh, yeah, okay, that's the classroom way to approach. But what if you're in real life, and this is a number you don't have, what do you do? You think, all right, can I measure it? Well, well that's hard, maybe. But can I figure out what this number, I mean, do I Google it? What is the number density of electrons in copper? Okay, fine, maybe that'll get you somewhere. Uh, but you think, can I get this from other things I do know? I had to make this assumption, and this is something one should look into. All right, so this is an assumption that's going into this calculation I've made. I know I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not wrong by more than a factor of two, although that's a lot, but whatever. So that's the assumption I made. And then based on this assumption, I say, ah, if I assume that, I can figure out the number density of copper because it's easy to look up the density of copper and the mass of one copper atom. So when I put that together, I get this. And so now I, now I can put that in here. So let's do that. I'm going to erase my unit conversions over here because I don't need them anymore. Do you like how I look nervously at the camera to make sure it's still recording? So let's put this in. So the drift velocity is 5.7 times 10 to the seventh amps per voltmeter. I'm going to be all scary about that. You know what I'm going to do is turn this amps into coulombs per second. Um, I'm in trouble already. Um, and I'm going to turn the volts into joules per coulomb. I see trouble looming on the horizon with units. I'm going to just proceed merrily as if I don't have a problem. 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs is the charge on the electron, times pi times 0 0.0025 meters squared times this number, 8.497 times 10 to the 28, 10 to the 28 meters to the minus 3. Do you like my parenthesis? All right, so those are now the numbers I can put in, but I do want to think a little bit more about units. Remember, a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So I can replace this with a kilogram. This will be a meters cubed now, because they had meters plus the meter squared from the joule, and I'll have a seconds up here. So if I think about all the units, I have meters to the minus three times meters squared. My units are a complete disaster. What have I done wrong? Um. Um, uh, <laughs> you've been laughing at me all this time saying, why is he putting in sigma for the current? Why? Because I'm dumb. That's ultimately the answer. Let's actually put the current in 5.5 coulombs per second. Yay, I feel so much better about my life now. So we can work out the units now. So coulombs cancels coulombs. Seconds, there's no other seconds, so I, I will have a per seconds. Then I have in the denominator, meters squared, and then meters to the minus 3 in the denominator. So if you think about that, meters squared in the denominator is meters to the minus 2. Meters to the minus 3 in the denominator is meters cubed in the numerator. Hey, look, meters cubed is meters to the minus 2 is meters. So I'm going to get meters per second. That is a wonderful and beautiful thing. So now I can put these numbers in my calculator. And so here's the result. 2.057 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second. That's slow, right? 
So, you know, it's like, here I am. I'm an electron, and I am in the copper wire, and there's 5.5 amps of current flowing, and I'm moving along at 2.2 meters per second, and I'm slow, which is not right at all. Of course, they're going all over the place. And then there's this little drift velocity, and occasionally they slowly go off in one direction. This is so spastic. Anyway, fine. There we go. Now we know the drift velocity, and of course to two sig figs, which is all the more we have, because of five point, for lots of reasons. It's just 2.1 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second. That's the drift velocity of electrons. I am wrong. That is the drift speed. The drift velocity is minus 2.1 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second x hat, right? Velocity is a vector. So what I calculated here was the drift speed. And we argued before if the current is in the plus x direction, electrons are moving in the minus x direction because they are negative. So I'm going to write down the drift velocity of electrons, and I'll keep the extra digits because I might use this number again. I don't know. 2.057 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second x hat. That's the drift velocity of electrons. One more part. I know you're thinking, wow, this is a long problem. We will survive if we are resolute. Part C. What is the electric potential difference between two ends of this wire? Well, that's not so hard, because in this case, um, we can use that the electric field times sigma um, is equal to the current density, right? Electric field times the conductivity. That's how conductivity is defined, is equal to the current density. But then what do I do with the electric field? Well, let's think, first of all, which direction is the electric field? The electric field's going to be pointing this way because it has to be in the same direction as J and J's in the plus X hat direction. And then if I want to get delta V between the ends of the wire, assuming the electric field is constant through the wire, and there's no reason why it wouldn't be, this delta R here is just um, L X hat, right, where L is the length. So delta V, this end minus that end, is minus E dot delta R which is just going to be E L. Well, minus E L, right? So this end minus this end is negative. That says this end is at the higher potential. So I can put all these things together. I can say sigma C E L in magnitude is equal to the magnitude of J. Um, or, sig oh, sorry, duh, not sigma C E L, that's sigma C E. So delta V over L is equal to minus E, right? So if I say delta V over L, um, and if I put in that absolute value too, I will go, because what I've done, by thinking about this, I figured out this is at higher potential. I'm just going to calculate the magnitude of it, and I'll get the sign, well, I'll just say it later. So the absolute value of delta L, or sorry, of delta V, is L times the absolute value of J over sigma C. So that is 2 meters times um, the absolute value of J we have up here, 280113 amps per meter. And we divide by sigma C, and now I really want to use that for real this time. 5.7 times 10 to the sevenths, sevenths, amps per volt per meter. Um, so if we think for a little bit, um, we're going to become sad. Because of units, what have I done? Uh, units, units, curses, units, you are always making my life interesting. Interesting is good. Because uh, uh, that's amps per meter squared. I feel so much better about my life now. Good. Uh, I wrote this wrong here, and it's been wrong all this time. That should have been amps per meter squared. It was amps per meter squared all this time. So units, I will have meters over meters squared. So I'll be left with one over meters, but one over meters in the denominator, one over meters in the numerator, cancel, cancel. Amps, cancel, amps, cancel. I have one over volts. It's gonna be volts, yay. Good, and volts is what we want. So now I just need to put these numbers, right, because delta V is in volts. I need to put these numbers into my calculator, and I get, 0 0.00098. Did I break that right? Zero point, no, I had one too many zeros. 0 0.0098 volts. Um, so to uh, two sig figs, that's zero point, in fact, I think that's it. That is it to two sig figs. We're excellent. Um, that's it. That is delta V. That's the magnitude of delta V. Remembering that this delta V is this side minus this side. 
and it was negative because magnitude would be e times the length of L. So this side's at the higher voltage, and that's fine. The electrons are, or not the electrons, <laughs> the current is being pushed towards lower voltage, and that's what happens. So delta V, and it's a really small delta V, right? 0.01 volts. And that's because copper wire is a conductor, so it doesn't take very much potential difference to drive a pretty big current through copper. There you go. That is the first problem. A capacitor has capacitance 7.2 microfarads and is initially charged to an electric potential of 18 volts. So I'm going to have a capacitor. Um, I'm going to say V of zero. So I'm going to write, I'm going to use V of time. You know what? No, I'm just going to call it V zero. Call it V zero um, is 18 volts at T equals zero. It, it, this is why it's important. Because we're going to pull current off the capacitor. As charge goes off, the voltage across it goes down. Okay. That's why I'm being anal about the time. If a circuit, how oh, and I should put down the capacitance, is, what did I say, 7.2 millifarads. Okay, good. If a circuit with no other batteries or capacitors is connected to this capacitor, so there's a circuit with, and we don't know what's in it, so I'll make it a, a blob circuit element. And that circuit draws a current of 0.015 amps. So here's I, I equals 0 0.015 amps from the capacitor for how long can the capacitor keep supplying the current? Well, here's the thing. Notice that I is charge per time. So charge per time crossing, say, this point, i.e. coming out of the capacitor. So I is going to be delta Q, delta T. Now, again, the capacitor has no net charge. What's going to happen is we're going to take positive charge off here. It's going to do whatever it does. And it's going to come back in here and negate out, cancel out the negative charge. So we have the same current going in here as here. So I is, is, is changing uh, the amount of charge that goes per time. The total delta Q is going to equal the initial charge of the capacitor minus zero, right? Because it starts with that much charge, it's going to end with zero charge, really maybe the other way around, but then we can just turn the direction of the current around. So that's delta Q, and we know that Q0 is equal to CV0, right? So CV0 over delta T is equal to I. And what we're interested in is delta T. That's just CV0 over I. So we can do this. This is not very hard. 7.2 times 10 to the minus 3 farads. What is a farad? Well, remember Q equals CV. So C is V over Q. So a farad is a volt per amp. So let's call that. It's a volt per amp. Um, times, I lied to you, it's a volt per coulomb, thank you, it's a volt per coulomb, right, because Q comes in coulombs, times the initial voltage, which is 18, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a disaster here, I should learn how to do algebra, shouldn't I, C is Q over V, I did that algebra wrong, so a farad is a coulomb per volt, right, yay, okay, good, we're good now, Q is CV, divide both sides by V, you have C is Q over V, so the units of that, farad, have to be units of this, coulombs per volt. So 7.2 times 10 to the minus 3 farads times 18 volts, so yay, the volts cancel, divided by the current, which is 0 0.015 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs per second. So the coulombs cancel. I have seconds to the minus 1 in the denominator. I will get seconds. That is right. Calculator. Little mistake here. I put in the minus, th that minus 3 shouldn't have been there. It was just... 0.015 coulombs per second, and then the coulombs canceled. And the result is 8.64 seconds, but we only have two sig figs, so I will say 8.6 seconds. So that is how long this capacitor could keep supplying that low current to this circuit. Now, this is an artificial question, because in practice, almost always, as the voltage of the capacitor goes down, you're not going to be able to drive as much current through the circuit. And so this current being constant is unlikely. The very last problem, I'll start handling that. Uh, but for now, given this slightly artificial problem, just the, the thing you have to think about is, you know, this isn't an equation I gave you, but I've told you what current is, charge per time, so you have to think about, don't just go and look at equations and find things you can use. Think about, okay, what's going on? Can I turn the things that I know is going on into equations? Current is charged per time. Well, I can write that as an equation, and time is a thing I want, and this is what I get. Problem number two. Okay, in problem number three, I have this circuit, and then there's this little word power. And now you're thinking, wait, 
How, uh, power. He totally didn't talk about that in class. What do I do? I tell you right now. Um, if you have some circuit element, it can be anything you want. Um, but the classic thing to think about is a resistor, and white light bulbs kind of work like resistors. Um, if you have current I going through this circuit element, and if, if the circuit element has voltage drop delta V across it, and for the circuit element that's not a battery, it's always going to be higher voltage upstream and lower voltage downstream, um, the power dissipated, which is the amount of energy, so delta E, but I mean change in energy, what that really is is the change in energy of the rest of the world given by this uh, circuit. So it's, this is the amount of energy dissipated in time delta T um, is just equal to I times delta V. Now, why would that be? Well, let's think about what I really is. I is like a Q over delta T, right? Um, let's call it delta Q again, because that's what I did in the last problem. So delta Q, it's an amount of charge over delta T that's being pushed through this. So in time, delta T, charge delta Q, gets pushed through this, and that's what I is. Well, okay, so let's think about it. If you have a charge delta Q, okay, and it gets pushed through voltage delta V, so delta Q, you have a charge, and don't think of this as a change in charge, but as like just a little amount of charge, because this is a little time. We often use delta for change in, we can also use it for a, just a short, a small amount. Whereas this delta V really is a change in voltage. Well, what is, remember, we had Q delta V is delta PE, right? Remember that? So this Q delta V is really a delta E. It's the amount of potential energy from the circuit, basically from the current flowing and all that, that is lost is delta E. So if I divide both sides by delta T, I get I delta V is equal to power. Right? So the power that's going to be used up, and how is it used up, is going to depend on the nature of the circuit element. If it's a capacitor, it actually stores that energy. Remember we talked about energy stored in a capacitor? Well, the power used up by a capacitor is actually then stored in the capacitor, and you can get it back out later. For a resistor or a light bulb, the power used up is radiated away as heat and light. So that's what's happening here. So we can use this, right? Here's the equation we didn't get to in class, P equals IV, where what this means is power used up by a circuit element, current through the circuit element, voltage across the circuit element. So we're going to use that now. So good, now that I know that, I can answer these questions. So question number three. The power radiated by a light bulb number two is twice that radiated by light bulb number one. So power two is twice power one. I should actually write what I'm saying. Right? So the power of the light bulb is twice that radiated by number one. What are the currents I1 and I2 in terms of V0 and I? Right? So I can't just say I1 is, or I2, I mean, I can look at this, and I know that both of them have voltage V0 across them, right? So I can say that V0I2, because that's power 2, is the voltage across it times the current through it. So that's I1, that's I2. So V0I2 is 2V0I1. And so now I know that um, I2 is 2I1, but I want it in terms also of I and V0, not just in terms of each other. So this is correct, but I'm not done yet. The one other thing I know is that I is equal to I1 plus I2. Okay, and that will give me enough to do the whole thing. So let's get rid of I2. So from this, I can say I2 is equal to I minus I1, right? I just rearrange that. Plug that in here. I have V0I minus V0I1 is equal to 2V0I1 or um, V0I is equal to 3V0I1. What was I actually asking for? I've totally forgotten now. Uh, what are the currents? Oh, well, yeah, we're basically done here, right? So therefore, I know that I1 is equal to I over 3, right? Divide both sides by V0, divide both sides by 3. We know that. Then I look at this. I have I over 3. What do I have to add to I over 3 so that this plus this is that? I2 has to be 2 thirds I. And now we are done. So. By knowing that power is VI and knowing the V across both of these was the same, um, and knowing that 
one power was twice the other power, and that the current has to be conserved at this junction. The total current in has to equal the current out. That's where I got this one from. Do the algebra, I can figure out one current is one third of I, the other current is two thirds of I, where I is the total current coming out of the circuit. That's problem number three. In the fourth problem, we have a more complicated circuit. So we have this. In fact, I'm going to start defining some things that I wasn't given, but I'll use them later. Current I comes out of the battery. That's what the ammeter will measure. Oh, in fact, yeah. And not only that, I told you what the ammeter measures. I didn't tell you it was I. It was 1.75 amps. So yay. That is what I is. That's what the ammeter measures. Then it goes through this light bulb, but then also goes through this light bulb. And we can't assume any of the light bulbs are the same as each other. The voltmeter reads 4.5 volts, so that's V1, by which I mean the voltage drop across light bulb number one is 4.5 volts. The power dissipated in light bulbs one and three is the same, so these two light bulbs are the same brightness. Right? What is the voltage drop across each light bulb and the current through each light bulb? You're like, wow. Okay. We already have one of the voltage drops, so we just have to get V2 and V3. Um, and we also have to get the current through each one. So let's define some more things. Let's call this I1, and let's call this I3, and let's start thinking about what we know. Well, all right, so if you consider this junction, the current in is I, right, it's coming here, and the current out is I1 plus I3, so we know that I is equal to I1 plus I3. The current here also all has to go through here, right? There's nowhere else for it to go. So we know that I2 is equal to I1. So once I found I1, I'm done with I2. We know that V3 is equal to V0. So we are now done with V3. And you know that V1 plus V2 has to equal V0. That's the loop rule, right? If I start here, I have plus V0 minus V1, because I'm going with the current, right? Minus V1 minus V2 equals 0. Loop like that, or right, the potential between here and here is V0, so V1 plus V2 has to equal V0. So we have that. So these are all the equations we have. So actually looking at this, we, it's not going to be too hard to do most of this. We already know V1, so V2 is equal to V0 minus V1. Um, so V2 is therefore equal to 12.0 uh, volts minus 4.5 volts. So this is a case where the, it's significant to the tenths place. 12 minus 4.5 is 7.5 volts, okay? So we have V1 is 4.5 volts, we have V2 equals 7.5 volts, and we have V3 is equal to V0, which is 12.0 volts. We actually know that one to three sig figs. Hey, we're already done with the voltages. So let's think about the currents. What else do we know about the currents? I'm gonna erase these, because we're done with them. We know these about the currents. We also know this. P1 equals P3, so that tells us that I1 V1 is equal to I3 V3, and V3, of course, is equal to V0. So I1 V1 is equal to I3 V0, and we actually know V1, um, but we don't know I1 and I3, but we can use this to get rid of, say, I1. So let's say that I1 is equal to I minus I3 from that. Substitute that in here, I will get V1 times I minus I3, so I've just substituted for I1, is equal to I3 V0. And all I have to do is solve this for I3, so I'm going to distribute V1 I minus V1 I3 equals V0 um, I3, I just wrote that the other way for symmetry. V1 I is equal to V1 I3 plus V0 I3 is equal to uh, V1 plus V0 quantity times I3. So I3 is equal to V1 over V1 plus V0 times I. Hey, I'm good now. So that's equal to 4.5 divided by 12 volts divided by 12. So V1 plus V0 is 12 plus um, 4.5, so 16.5 volts, I can't do this one in my head, times I, which is 1.75 amps, volts cancel volts, we use a calculator, and we get I3 equals 0 0.477 amps, that's I3, so what do we have so far? 
So far we only have I3. So we have I3 is equal to 0. Point, and of course, what is this good to? We have two sig figs here. We have, th we have two sig figs. So I3 is, e is 0. 0.48 amps. And that's good. And now that I know that, I can go back to, we'll use this one again. So I1 is equal to I, 1.75 amps, minus 0. 0.48 amps. I don't need the extra digits in this case. Can I do that in my head? I really ought to be able to, because it's going to be 1.37 amps, right? That's I1. Because 0.37, I'll get, no, 1.27 amps. Yes. So 0.27 plus 0.48, 2 plus 4, that'll give me a 60, and 8 plus 5, 15. Yes, good. So I1 is 1.27 amps, and remember I2 equals I1. So I1 equals I2 equals 1.27 amps. And we are done. Now, what I want you to take away from this is you start with this circuit and you're like, oh my god, there's a lot. But we knew stuff, and what we do is we just slow down, we don't panic, we start writing down the things we know. All right, we know this from the junction, good. Um, we know, where's the loop thing I used? Oh, I've already erased it, but I had it up here before. We know going around this loop that this voltage plus this voltage equals this. We know this voltage equals that. Once you've written down all the things you know, you can then do algebra, and sometimes the algebra becomes a huge nightmare. In this case, it really wasn't bad. You can do a little bit of algebra to figure out the things that you don't know. So start by writing down everything you know, use them to figure out the things you don't know, and we're done. We can actually figure out what all of this is. There you go, problem number whichever one I just did, four, I think. The text of the last problem is long, so I'm not going to read the whole thing out. Go download the PDF and read it yourself. But here's the basic idea of what's going on. So you have a capacitor, capacitance C, and it's initially charged up to voltage V. Um, we know that Q is equal to CV, and we know that the total energy in the capacitor, so this is not electric field, that's energy, is 1 half CV squared, or if I take C times V, so CV squared is C times V times V, if I take one of those C times Vs, I can turn this into 1 half QV, and I get the same thing, right? Do a little bit of substitution, you can make that work. Okay, now here's the deal. If I connect a wire to some kind of circuit elements out here, happy circuit, um, current and I let current I flow for however long. Um, great. The total amount of uh, time that the current will flow. This is something we we did in the previous problem. We know that the total charge there is to flow out is going to equal I times the time that the current flows. So that's how long the current will flow, right? So the current times the amount of time it flows is the total amount of charge that flows, and the total amount of charge that flows is however much charge we started with, because once there's no more charge, no more charge is going to flow, right? Remember there's plus Q here and minus Q there, so the plus Q comes over here and comes up here, and a plus Q and a minus Q cancel each other out. Good. Finally, finally, the power dissipated in whatever happy circuit is, is going to be the current going through it, times the voltage across it, which is just V. P is IV, which is also uh, the total energy dissipated delta E by delta T. In fact, I'm just going to say this E over delta T. Well, so T is the time that the current flows, and E is the total amount of energy dissipated or used up in happy circuit. So let's put all of this together, and let's figure stuff out. Power is IV. Great. That's E over delta T. Let's figure out what E is based on all this other stuff, right? So I can do that. So E is equal to I V delta T. So we have I V delta T, but if I write that I delta T V, hey, I delta V T is E equals Q V. So let's think about this. This is the total energy used and used, by which I mean dissipated. So if it was like a light bulb, it means radiated away in happy circuit. as the capacitor discharges. And this is energy initially stored in capacitor. And now we see the problem. 
they are not the same. In fact, we are discharging twice as much energy as we started with. When, right, we now have not just a perpetual motion machine, but an infinite energy generation machine, all the world's problems are solved. Happiness. Or this could mean that there's an error in this reasoning somewhere. And that's really what happened. None of the algebra is wrong. But I did make an assumption that was wrong. And I put this problem in specifically because this is an assumption that shows up in lots of places that I see people making incorrectly. What was the assumption I made? So let's step back and think about hidden assumptions in what I've done. There's, there's sort of one big hidden assumption. And let's just look at this, right? Let's think about what this means. Q is the total amount of charge that flows. Delta T is the total amount of time that elapses. So this is an equation very much like distance is velocity times time, or that's the distance something goes, or rather speed, that's the rate at which it's going, and that's the time it goes for. But remember, this equation only works if the speed is a constant. So likewise, this equation only works if I is constant. Well, is I constant? Think about what's happening. As charge leaves the capacitor, the voltage across the capacitor is going down, right? So I'm also in trouble here where I assumed um, this was constant. Turns out the voltage is not constant, right? As current flows, Q is going down. As Q goes down, V goes down. C doesn't change because this depends only on the geometry of the capacitor. Well, so we already know that V isn't constant, so already we're in trouble. But almost certainly, I mean, you could engineer something that would draw a constant current, right? That's possible to do. Far more common, if you have some sort of happy circuit over here, as the potential difference across it goes, remember potential, electric potential is related to, to energy, as the potential difference across it goes, it would be like the electric field getting smaller. It's probably not going to be able to push charges fast through. So usually, not always, usually when the potential difference goes down, the current will also go down too. So we know V isn't constant, and I is probably not constant. Right? So that was our mistake. You can't use this as is if I is not constant over all of delta T. Same thing for all, right? Well, this is fine at an instant, but this, conflating this E with this E is a mistake because this power is not constant over all of this delta T. So that's what went on there. You have to really think about what's constant. Later, we will actually play with capacitors in lab and discover if I replace happy circuit with a resistor or a light bulb would work too. What's going to happen is the voltages over time is going to go down with a curve, something like that. Um, and the current will go down and the power will go down the same way. And if you actually handle keeping track of the changes and handle it here and handle it here correctly, the energy will work out perfectly and it will all be fine. You need calculus to really make it work, um, to calculate it for right. But the key is here, the warning, don't just use the simple equations if they don't apply. And the simple equations often assume that stuff stays constant. So you really got to ask yourself, does stuff stay constant? Well, you know, it's the, it's the danger of plugging in the variables you have and just assuming it works. Right? So be careful about that. That's the less problem.